we must assist MVP in doing more during the next year. And we've raised right now, uh, we've got $18,000 that serves as a challenge. So feel free to help us meet that challenge while we're on the air this evening by hitting the donate donut button. Uh, Julie will be putting the donation link in the chat. Contribute during the program as you see fit. Uh, your donations will put canvassers in the field going door to door for candidates who believe in democracy, social justice, a woman's right to make her personal decisions without the interference of government, LGBTQ plus rights, and several other policies that we strongly believe in. Next year will be too late. So hit the donate button during our uh, conversation here today. And uh, I will now turn it over to Jillian Johnson. Jillian. Thank you so much, Steve, and welcome everyone. Thank you all for being here with us this evening. Um, first, I'm so thrilled to be able to introduce our featured speaker for the evening, um, North Carolina Attorney General Josh Stein. Josh Stein grew up in Orange County, North Carolina, where he attended Chapel Hill High School. He earned his bachelor's degree from Dartmouth College and later studied at Harvard, where he earned his master's in public policy at the Kennedy School of Government and his JD at Harvard Law School. As a young attorney, Stein worked with the Self-Help Credit Union in Durham to build affordable homes and with the North Carolina, North Carolina Minority Support Center to raise capital for investment in small businesses across the state. He's been active in community mm -hmm. service, serving on the advisory board of Triangle Family Services, Downtown Raleigh Alliance, and Interact, Wake County's domestic violence organization. As Deputy Attorney General of North Carolina from 2001 to 2008, he took on utility companies, telemarketing scammers, and payday lenders. From 2009 to 2016, Stein served in the state Senate and championed legislation that expanded the renewable energy tax credit, encouraging growth in the clean technology sector, and helping protect the environment. During his tenure in the state Senate, Stein was honored by the Equality North Carolina Federation for advocating for LGBT equality and received the Defender of the Environment Award from the North Carolina League of Conservation Voters for his defense of air and water quality. Stein took office in January of 2017 as Attorney General and has announced his run for governor in 2024. Josh Stein and his wife Anna have three children and in his what I'm sure is a copious amount of free time, he enjoys playing soccer, coaching, and cheering for his children's sports teams, biking, and watching college sports. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Josh Stein. Welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. All right, Jillian, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. And it's great to be with everyone this evening. And I want to thank you all for having me tonight. Uh, but more importantly, I want to thank you all for being on uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, in October of 2023 on, on a Monday night, because you clearly understand what is important and what is at stake uh, facing North Carolina. And I think that if I had to guess, the reason that you all are on this call right now is because, like me, you love North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina is my home. It's where I grew up. It's where my wife grew up. It's where we raised our three kids. They all went to North Carolina public schools, just like Anna and I did. Uh, North Carolina is our home. And sadly, today, our home is under assault. Right-wing politicians in Raleigh are taking a sledgehammer to its foundation. They are defunding public schools. They are restricting reproductive freedoms. They are attacking voting rights. And just as we speak, they are gerrymandering legislative districts. So we've got our work cut out for us. Uh, the one solace in all of this extremism that we're having to face is that we can win still. Good organizing can beat a bad gerrymander. So it's going to be on us to put our state, our home back on a solid foundation and restore North Carolina. Uh, and honestly, that's why the work that you all do is so important. Uh, investing in grassroots organizing is critical to winning elections, particularly in close races as they almost always are here in North Carolina, from the local all the way to the state levels. Um, if you look at my races, for instance, uh, in 2020, uh, I was elected with 23,000 votes to spare. And I mean, that was in 2016. In 2020, I won with 13,000 votes to spare. 
Uh, that is out of a total of five and a half million votes cast, which is essentially what an effective field campaign can generate. So volunteers and field organizers make all of the difference in who wins and who loses. And so it's on us to get to work, uh, to get building. And when we do build winning campaigns and build strong grassroots organizations that are connected to the people they, they serve and, and represent, then that is when we will build a safer and stronger and more prosperous North Carolina. Uh, and so I want to thank you all for the opportunity to be with you tonight. Uh, Jillian, thank you for helping pull this together and giving me the opportunity to, to talk to folks. Uh, and thank you for everything you're going to be doing over the next 12 months to make sure that North Carolina is the kind of state that we want it to be where my kids and grandkids, your kids and grandkids all want to call home just like we do. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate you. And um, yeah, good luck with all of your work. Thanks, Jillian. Y'all take Thank care. You. you too. Bye-bye. Thanks, y'all. Um, so now I'm going to take a minute to introduce myself. <laughs> Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Jillian Johnson. I'm the North Carolina State Advisor for Movement Voter Project. And this evening, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about MVP, um, the electoral picture that we are facing over the next uh, several years in North Carolina. And then I'll be introducing the three incredible grassroots leaders who are going to be speaking on our panel. Um, so first, just a, a little bit of introduction about an uh, information about Movement Voter PAC. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Um, Movement Voter PAC um, is part of the Movement Voter Universe, um, is our PAC arm. And we have a, a PAC here in North Carolina. Um, and we help donors invest in grassroots organizations in swing states and districts to win elections and build progressive power for policies and governance that improves the lives of all Americans. That's our that's our tagline. Um, but I'll tell you what that actually means. So we work hard to target the most pivotal races and places that will shape our country now and in the long term. And then we invest in the best local groups that are organizing in the most marginalized communities to mobilize the most disenfranchised voters who have the power to tip the closest races. And when we win those elections, we can then win transform transformative policy changes by building those, gr those lasting grassroots power networks that can both get people elected and then hold them accountable and make sure that policies change as a result um, of, of having those folks in power, of having elected uh, our champions. Um, I'm going to share with you all a few slides that were prepared by our partners at Put NC First, the North Carolina Donor Table, about the outlook for North Carolina this year and over the next several years and why we must and can win here in our state. Um, so on our next slide, you're going to see a timeline of North Carolina over the next decade, our next four elections. So in 2024, um, we're a presidential battleground state. We have an open governor's race. Our governor is termed out. Um, and all 170 state legislative seats, as in every election, are up. We also have a state Supreme Court race with a really critical seat um, where the, the person in that seat has, has resigned. Um, and we it's one of only two seats currently held by Democrats on the North Carolina Supreme Court. And if we want a chance of taking back the court, we need to hold that seat. Um, in 2026, we have a opportunity for a U.S. Senate pickup seat, again, all of our state legislative seats, and another state Supreme Court race where we, again, need to move um, as many seats as we can towards, um, towards the Democrats. In 2028, once again, a presidential battleground state, we have our governor's race once again, where we will hopefully be defending an incumbent Democratic governor. Um, another U.S. Senate race, of course, all of our state legislative seats. And in 2028, that is the first time that we have the opportunity to flip the Supreme Court back to Democratic control. And then finally, in 2030, we have what's called a blue moon election year, where there are no top of the ticket races, no presidential race, no Senate race, and no governor's race. But it will be the year that we um, elect the, the state legislature that will do the redistricting after the 2030 census. Um, and we know after the 2010 and the 2020 census that were those were opportunities for, unfortunately, some really horrific right wing gerrymandering in our state. And so that's going to be a really, really critical year for us to um, to have control over the state House and Senate 
in order to prevent those unfair districts um, from recurring. Um, on the next slide, you'll see um, some data about our last few elections where you can see how tight the margins are in statewide elections in North Carolina, where we are coming within 0.7% of a win, but continue to um, fall short of victory by, again, an average of less than two points from between 1.9 and 0.7 points in these four elections. So you can see just how close we are to being able to pull out statewide wins um, for the Democrats in federal elections. Um, and then at the state level over the last eight years or so, you can see on the next slide that we've really been um, going back and forth between Republican and Democratic control in our institutions. In our state legislature, of course, in 2014 and 2016, we had a Republican supermajority and we were able to beat that supermajority um, for a bit. And now we are back. Um, for the in the governor's mansion, we um, were lucky to elect um, a Democratic governor. Um, sorry, can I have the previous slide? Thank you. Sorry. Um, in 2016, and of course, um, Governor Roy Cooper has stayed in office through this year, and we'll you know have a we'll hopefully be able to elect a new um, a new Democratic governor in 2024. And then on our Supreme Court, we've gone from Republican control to Democratic control and then back to Republican control. Um, so you can see it's really been, you know, a back and forth, a tug of war between um, between the, the major parties at the state level. Um, and our next slide, we'll talk a little bit about North Carolina's current electorate. So um, what our what our allies have have shown their research is that neither party really has an overwhelming advantage. Um, the Democrats are slightly behind in base and um, sporadic voters, uh, slightly behind the Republicans by a little over a percent. But if you see here in the middle, we've got 1.1 million voters in our persuasion universe. And those are folks who, if we can do the right kind of field work, we can get them on our side and get them out to vote for, for the candidates that, um, that are gonna do the right thing here in our state. We also have um, on the next slide, the Democrats have a huge advantage in potential, dem potential Democratic voters who are not currently registered to vote. Um, and so we know that if we continue to make the right kind of investments, um, in growing our base that we can mo that we can organize and mobilize these people to get out to vote. Um, the Republicans are making investments in growing their base and we have to make comparable investments, comparable investments in growing ours. And I think this last point is really important that the state is not going to break our way just because of demographic shifts or growth, that we have to also be investing in the organizations and the people on the ground who are going to move our state in, in the right direction. Um, and finally, um, while while you know growth is not the only factor, it is of course an important um, part of North Carolina's story. We're now the third fastest growing state in the country, um, and so opportunities to expand the electorate will will continue to increase. But we need to be making appropriate investments to make sure um, that those new voters are are voting for the candidates that are going to um, that are going to build our state in in a more progressive direction. Um, so finally, our 2024 electoral goals deliver North Carolina's 16 electoral votes to President Biden, win the open win the open governor's race, break the Republican supermajority, and win the North Carolina Supreme Court race, at least holding the line um, where we have it now on the Supreme Court. And that leads us to our plan to achieve those goals, um, which includes a robust and statewide coordinated field plan to knock 3.8 million doors minimum in 48 counties across the state. Um, and we've divided the state up into anchor counties, which are the counties where we can turn out, we believe we can turn out the most democratic votes, emergent counties where people are, um, where, the, where our base is, is growing, and then hold the line counties where we want to raise our margins as much as possible and cut the margins for the Republicans. Um, and this plan is being put together by our state donor table, put in C first, um, our C4 table, and a number of MVPs, incredible partners who are, um, three of whom are here with us tonight to share the work of their organizations and their um, what they plan to do to help make sure that North Carolina um, turns blue in 2024. 
So um, it's my honor to introduce the three grassroots leaders who will be participating on our panel this evening. Our first speaker will be Mr. Mev Melvin Motford from the A. Philip Randolph Educational Fund. Melvin was born on his family's black owned farm in Eastern North Carolina. He received his Bachelor of Arts in Labor Studies and uh, Bachelor of Arts in Labor Education from the National Labor College and later completed the nonprofit management program at Duke University. After finishing high school, he went to work at a plywood plant to earn his way through college and was elected as an officer of his local union, International Woodworkers of America, IWA Local 5347 at 19 years old. He later became vice president and president of the local, a position in which he served for 12 years. In 1988, Melvin became the National Assistant Secretary Treasurer for the International Woodworkers of America and was the first Black officer of the International Union. In 1991, he became National Vice President and was the first Black National Vice President as well. In 2015, the North Carolina A. Philip Randolph Educational Fund was formed and Melvin was elected President and CEO. And in 2018, Melvin was also elected unanimously to the board of directors of the A. Philip Randolph Institute, which is the national affiliate of the North Carolina chapter. Um, our second speaker will be Dreema Caldwell. Dreema is the co-director of Down Home North Carolina, a grassroots rural organizing group working in small towns and rural places across the state. She is a native to Alamance County where she attended public school, community college, and raised her two adult children, Xavier and Nicole. Before coming into leadership at Down Home, Dreema spent over 20 years in early childhood education and five years in hospitality. After a negative experience with the criminal legal system, Dreema joined Down Home as a member working in the Stop Criminalizing the Poor Working Group, helping to start the Alamance Bail Fund. She later ran for county commissioner as the first Black woman to run in the county. Down Home NC is her political home, and it is where she first learned more about local, state, and national politics. Using her own lived experiences and uplifting the experiences of others, she's focused on building working class people's leadership, building people power, and fighting for racial justice. And finally, our third speaker will be Theo Lubke. Theo is a North Carolinian with more than 20 years of experience in electoral politics, movement building, faith-based community organizing, teaching, training, and grassroots democratic practice. From 2012 to 2017, he was the North Carolina Organizing Director for the America Votes C4 Table, supporting progressive organizing and infrastructure in response to the right wing's rise in the state. Prior to America Votes, he taught high school science for five years and attended Duke Divinity School, graduating in 2012. In 2018, he co-founded the Carolina Federation alongside, alongside Sindolo Domina and served as co-director from 2018 to 2023. Um, we are so grateful to have these incredible leaders here with us tonight. Um, they're each going to speak, and then we'll have um, some time to to ask questions. So thanks so much, y'all. Take it away. Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you know, I'm, I'm Melvin Montford. Uh, President, CEO of North Carolina Philip Randolph Educational Fund. Uh, you heard my bio, so I won't get into all of that. Um, we have a C3 and a C4. The C3 started in 1985. Uh, but after we after what happened in 2010 with the state legislature and the years after that, we realized that we need to go to another, another tactic. So in 2015, we created uh, the C4 so we could have a full spectrum of uh, electoral tactics. Our organization was founded by Philip Randolph and Baird Rustin, and they gave us only three um, objectives. Uh, the first objective was to encourage expansion of Black political activity on all three levels of government. And they laid out that we needed to do voter registration, mass voter registration, mass get out the vote, uh, and, and mass vote education. So our organization is based on those, those three things. That's, that's what we do as primary. It's not secondary for us. We do voter registration year round. Uh, we do get out the vote work, whether it's municipal or presidential or congressional elections. And we do vote education year round. Uh, right now, uh, the tweet on the C4 side, we have 11 staff people, hardworking staff people. Uh, 
They're in the process of helping us build our base and capacity. Right now, we have 22 chapters across the state. By the end of this year, we'll, we'll have 32. And the goal is by, by June of next year, when we do the big kickoff of our 2024 plan, uh, is to have, is to have uh, 50 chapters. We're on target. We're going to get that done. What this does, and I know I got five minutes, this builds, what this has done for us, it builds a base in the communities. Because in those communities, we have what we call command centers. And we have seven command centers across the state. They have an office. They have a training part to them. They have a staging area. They have phone banks and all of that stuff. So by the time the election main season comes next year, uh, we're going to double that across the state. That's what we need to win. Uh, we need to register 200,000 people. This organization alone needs to register 200,000 people. And there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that if we're resourced, we'll get that. The 200,000 is really a minimum of what we can get. And we know that. So uh, that's who we are. This is what we do. This is what we do. This is what we play for every day. This is what I go to bed thinking about at night. This is what I wake up thinking about in the morning. Uh, let's see. I talked about the chapters that we have, but we have three different groups of chapters. We have an LGBTQ group. We have a, what we call a standard chapter, which everybody can belong to. And then we have youth chapters. We have eight of those across the state where you can join as soon as you can sign your name and you leave as soon as you turn 29 years old. So. We're well embedded in the state. This is our home state. We are trying to be civil. We, that's hard though. We're 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 upset about what's happened to our state. We can do better than that, and with your support and help, we will. We got to take our state back. This is what what the legislature is doing. Is not the North Carolina that I grew up knowing, and we're gonna fight. We're gonna take it back. The term Tar Heel has nothing to do with a basketball team because if you invite us to the fight like they have, our state legislature, we're not going to quit till the fight's over. So we're here to stay. They can redistrict. They can do whatever they want to. We're going to fight to win. And with your help, we're going to do that. Thank you. Then I hope I didn't go with my five minutes. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Mr. Melvin. Um, so we believe at Down Home, we're currently in the uh, middle of facing a triple crisis, a crisis of democracy, authoritarianism is looming, a climate crisis where millions of our people could be displaced, and a civil society crisis where we don't even know our neighbors anymore. We believe that community organizing is the antidote for these crises. And at Down Home, we... Um, 80 out of 100 counties here in North Carolina are rural. And so we work in the rural counties of the state. Um, we believe that no matter where you come from, though, whether you're Black, white, working class, or rural, um, that you we all want the same things. We all want good schools, affordable housing, clean environment, and the ability to go to the doctor without the fear of drowning in debt. Um, we intentionally organize across race with poor and working class people in small towns and rural counties. And our people, um, down home bills, um, power through local chapters. We currently have eight chapters across the state. Um, and we um, invest in rural movement building year round, not just for election cycles, working class people, um, we identify what issues they need to be addressed, and we build local campaigns around those things and then help to hold the uh, officials accountable. Uh, down home members guide our work and create a working class mandate and platform um, and also endorse our candidates that model the, model the values that we have. North Carolina is an important state, not just because we live here, 
but it's important to the whole country. North Carolina is a true battlefield that needs support and investment to actualize the needs of working class people. We know at Down Home that we can win. Down Home has proven with investment and limit and resources and time and organizing that we can win. Down Home members in Cabarrus helped to hold off the supermajority in 2022, which was stolen back. Down Home will be running an ambitious field program next year, expanding our reach to 19 rural counties. Far-right extremists are running for our governor and we will fight to make sure that, that doesn't happen. The supermajority that controls Raleigh has passed harmful and hateful legislation that goes against our values as a state. They're attacking our schools and our transgender gender children and voting rights instead of supporting people's work. We will mobilize voters in 20 counties. Sorry, hang on. We will mobilize uh, voters in 20 counties and we will be seeking to have a total of 133,000 conversations with over 500 door knocks and make over 750,000 uh, phone calls. So there's plenty of work here to do. We have spent a year planning with our partners on what to do. And so we're just asking for you to invest in North Carolina because we know that the South is, is there goes the country. So your investment in North Carolina is truly an investment in the whole country. Thank you. Thank you, Dreema. Uh, my name is Theo Lupke, um, and I'm the Partnerships Director at the Carolina Federation, um, and it's good to be here with all of you. Um, the Carolina Federation uh, is a statewide independent political organization uh, here in North Carolina, and our goal, like many other people on this call, is to, is to build a governing majority for our people. Um, we want to get our people in a position so that they can be the ones leading the state and, and uh, determining the future of this state. Um, and like many others on this call, we we do that with a combination of uh, base building and community organizing, uh, deep leadership training, uh, and some real brass knuckles approaches to to talking to voters at scale. Um, and I just want to lift up, you know, the work of of, uh, of APRI, of Down Home, of our friends at Siembra, and so many others uh, who who are coming together this year uh, to really do voter contact on a scale that has not been done in this state for over a decade. Um, the number that you saw at the top, uh, 3.8 million, of which I think about 1.5 million uh, door knocks are just among the three organizations represented on this call. Um, that is a very large number that we haven't come close to hitting before in this state. And it's a real testament to uh, the groups who've come together to the Put North Carolina First Donor Table to funders like MVP, um, that we have a collective vision uh, to really put us on a track to hit the kind of numbers that our friends in Georgia and Virginia have been hitting for several cycles. And we know that uh, being able to talk to voters at that level of scale um, is going to be the difference, um, both in the close races, like Attorney General Stein mentioned, um, those close races in uh, Cabarrus County that Dreama just mentioned, right? Uh, the 600 votes, those 10,000 votes, but also um, being able to contact the many voters, register those hundreds of thousands of voters uh, that Mr. Montford mentioned, all of that is going into making a permanent shift in the electorate of North Carolina and making, therefore, making a permanent shift in, in the direction and the future of this state. Um, you know, and as Jillian said, like, and as others have said as well, uh, that, um, that costs money. You know, and so um, the investments that folks are are making in these deeply rooted, grassroots, connected, base organizations who do this work year round, who understand the communities, who hire people out of the communities, um, those are the investments that are going to ultimately turn the tide of this state um, and really make a difference on in the long run. Um, so uh, I'm just really uh, have great gratitude for for those folks who are making this possible. Um, who have this vision uh, both to win in the short term, but also to win in the long term. Um, and grateful to all those on this call who um, 
who are willing to step up and support this important work. So, I, I would. I, this is David Keel. I hope you can hear me. Can people hear mm -hmm. me? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, I'm. I'm with the Registered Vote North Carolina. Uh, a colleague is Steve Hockfield, and I just want to say that I'm just so proud that I could bust that to be associated with Mr. Montford, Ms. Caldwell, Mr. Lubke, the fantastic organizations that they lead and the kinds of things they're doing for North Carolina and the spectacular efforts they are making and will make. Um, we have raised about $15,000 so far. I would really like to double that before the night is over. I think that we could, I think that we could, uh, if my calculations are right, with $30,000, we could put uh, about six organizers in the field for three months or something like that, or maybe more, maybe seven or eight. I'll let, let the expert know, but it, we're be talking about that that amount of money would allow us to reach hundreds and thousands of more voters. So I'm, I'm going to give some more. I'm going to click that donate line. And I'm really encouraging you uh, to do that too. And I've, can we put also put the, uh, I believe the link, yeah, is the link to donate is also in the, in the chat, we could use that, I believe. So I'm, I'm really encouraging people to go ahead and do that. Uh, uh, while we're speaking, make another donation. Uh, I'm gonna do that. Uh, uh, and, but if you don't do it now, do it right after the show, the pre this presentation. So strike while the iron the heart, that's very important. And, I, and uh, we're just so privileged to have folks like Melvin and Theo and Dreama and then the MVP, which is making all of this possible by being an umbrella funding organization. And, and they fund, fund about 40 other organizations uh, of terrific quality working in North Carolina as well. So let's give them the resources they need to do, to do the job. So I believe we're gonna have a question and answer now. Is that correct, Julian? Um, thanks, David. I think we've got Lisa real quick and then we'll go. Oh, to yeah, Kim. I'm sorry. Yeah, Lisa, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, uh, Lisa, Lisa Tracy, who is the uh, movement voter, major donor advisor, she's going to tell us how to donate some more and uh, answer any questions and how to get our questions answered. So I'll give it to you, Lisa, and then I think we'll have a uh, have, uh, question and answer. And then Julian, I think Jeff Bloom, leader of All In for North Carolina, is going to give the have the final word thanks david um this is super brief um i'm a senior donor advisor at the movement voter pack um and um you were just given the information about how to donate online um if you would like to give some other way than online check or wire um some other way um that information will go out tomorrow um in an email to everyone who's who was here today and um, or you could write me directly at Lisa Tracy one word Lisa Tracy one word at movement.vote. So kicking it back to Jillian for Q and A. Thank you so much, Lisa um, and uh, David and everybody who's donated um, and folks who are donating right now. We appreciate you so much. Um, if we could pull our panel back into the into the hot seat into the spotlight, <laughs> please. Um, we're gonna open it up to questions. So if you have any questions for um, our panelists, our amazing grassroots leaders who are gonna be knocking 3.8 million doors here in North Carolina in 2024, uh, you can put your questions in the chat or you can um, also put them in the, the Q&A feature, um, feature in the Zoom. Um, so anybody who has a question, please just um, put it in the chat or in the Zoom. Um, and I'll start out with a question of my own. Could you all talk a little bit more um, about how this coordinated campaign came together? I know I've been telling 
folks at MVP and all the donors that we work with that this is like a dream come true for me to see all these amazing organizations in North Carolina um, working so closely together and also starting you know, so early, like y'all had already, y'all started meeting in like March of this year or something to plan for 2024. Could y'all talk a little bit about um, just how this campaign came together? Um, and yeah, what you're what you're excited about with this collaboration? Let's start with Dreama. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, I think um, we, we started, um, I guess conversation started around our AV table about uh, just a general what a win number would look like and um, what would be needed. And so um, we were meeting quite frequently, like weekly on a Friday, we were all coming together, meeting, looking at past voting data, um, and then just looking to see what what, what we needed. And um, there was uh, some conversation that began about who's in what area, who can do what work. Um, I think we're all stretching ourselves and really expanding our capacity this year to help this field program. And I'll let you, you either of you want to talk about that process. Yeah, uh, uh, most most of us in the cohort we we've known each other for a while, uh, but the way we'd gone about doing this work in the past, it was more like separate organizations. Even though we were in a table, we still worked separately, uh, and we were just talking and said we all know each other. And the biggest thing that drives this for us is we all trust each other because we all know each other, know each other's work, uh, and that each partner, if they say they're going to do something, they're going to be able to hold up their end. So the trust was a big factor in us putting this together. We started, uh, some of us started talking about it as early as, as December last year in January. Uh, so somebody came to me and says, well, can you do three times what you did in 2022? Yeah, we start soon enough we can. Uh, so that's how I got started. We, we said, we need to do something together. We need to stop. Uh, we're all trying to go to the same place. We're trying to get the right people elected. So we trust each other. So let's get together and put down a real solid plan uh, that we can do going forward. Beyond 2024, sure, but beyond 2024. So that's how it got started. Yeah, and I'll just add that, that this is not just about uh, quantity of doors, although quantity matters um, given the scale of, of what we're up to. It's also about quality. And I just want to lift up that, you know, particularly for for like down home uh, and for for APRI, I mean, just all kinds of innovation is happening around um, how to make sure that the conversations that are happening at the door are high quality conversations and not just that actually are set. We can move people, either move them from not being a voter to being a voter or move them from one candidate or one position on an issue to another. And I just really want to lift up that part of what makes this coalition of folks working together uh, so powerful is, is the level of innovation and the dedication to having quality conversations that are real on the door uh, and not just kind of perfunctory knock and run, because we know that those don't work. We know it works. It's having people from the community knocking on doors in their own community, having real conversations, meeting people where they are, and moving them. Um, and that's really where the work is, and that's really where the change happens. Thanks so much, y'all. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. So a uh, question from John, how do the organizations divide the turf to avoid duplication of effort? Um, let's start with Theo this time. Uh, sure. I mean, it's just what Mr. Montford said. I mean, we 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 uh, we literally divide it up. You're going to this precinct. You're going to this county, um, or you're going on this week, and we're going on that week. Um, there, you should see the spreadsheets. They're they're massive and color coded. But really, at the end of the day, it comes down to to trust and and the kind of conversations that we're having now a year out. Um, and so we we have a lot of runway still where we can work out uh, who's in what counties um, and what what certain sets of voters people are voting for. Um, I'll just give you an example in our counties um, where we have we're in close partnership with Siembra, North Carolina. We carve out all of the Latine doors 
all the Latinx doors in our counties are knocked by Siembra. Uh, and so we just have that understanding. Um, and there's similar relationships that happen both uh, all across the state. Um, and that's just really because of, again, the strength of the relationships and, and starting so early so that there's time to have these conversations. Um, awesome. Thanks, y'all. Um, Laura wants to know, are you getting money from the state and national democratic organizations? I haven't received any. We haven't received any. So so, uh, so the answer from, for me is for our, my organization is, is no. Yeah, we, we have not either. We ha also have an independent expenditure pack, so we wouldn't. Yeah, we have we don't receive money. Thanks, y'all. Yeah, I think that, you know, just highlights the need for for folks like us to be funding this incredible work because it really depends on on individual donors and and grassroots organizing to get the money in the door to be able to be able to make sure um, that y'all have the the resources that you need to do to do this important work. Um, Judith is asking, are you going to be focusing on asking rural folks if they really want their tax dollars to go to the private schools in Raleigh and Charlotte instead of supporting the public schools their children attend? This seems like a topic that should get their attention and make them vote blue. Can y'all talk a little bit about any work you might be doing on the um, education issue in public schools? Yes, yeah, so and we actually uh, at Down Home, we actually do uh, anchor a coalition um, along with a couple of uh, partners, um, EGA, EJA, um, as well as the Heal Network. And so it's our public school strong network. And so we've been training leaders to show up at their school board meetings, to be able to write op eds, to be able to um, make comments. Um, and that has been happening with not just rural people, not just counties that we're in. We actually have uh, public school strong teams in 61 counties currently that are showing up at uh, school board meetings now. And so education is part of the, the conversation when we're at the doors as well as uh, other things. So yeah, just really helping them understand what's happening with public schools is important. Yeah, and and for us, it uh, uh, you take places like like Halifax County has has three school systems, uh, and most of the low income kids go to the, the worst one. Uh, we fought like the devil years ago to to get the county commissioners in a position where they would change that. And as soon as we did, our state legislature came in and tried to take over that that school system. Uh, so the legislature that we have, a lot of educators are afraid. Uh, that if they do surface publicly some things that that the legislature is going to come in and and uh, try to take it over and make it worse. So we get that from a lot of school board folks, a lot of school teachers, uh, especially when that CRT thing came up last year, where they are actually afraid. So that gives us a position where we can speak on behalf of the education system and public school system, and they don't have to sort of put themselves out there. But yes, uh, that is a major fight. Us uh, one that we gotta win. Uh, I went to public schools. Uh, my children and grandchildren and great grandchildren go to public schools in North Carolina, and we're gonna fight like hell to save and and uh, and actually improve our public school system. Uh, but we know that we gotta have a legislature that's gonna be fair when it comes to funding the school system and stop taking money away from it so they can make it look bad and try to convince people that we don't need it. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thanks so much, y'all. Education is such an important issue in North Carolina and, you know, of course, in lots of states around the country, every state in the country. Um, we've got a question about social media. So can y'all talk a little bit about how you might be incorporating social media into grassroots voter contact um, and especially to communicate with young people? Okay, I, I don't want to go on first, but that's that's an interesting question because, because like I said, we we have we have eight youth chapters across the state, and 
And that's one of the reasons we got into social media because they said folks like me uh, that we were behind. Uh, so uh, people know about Facebook and uh, they started using, uh, I forgot what the one is now, years ago before it got popular. So we depend on our young folks to tell us what's new and what's trending, what's happening and what young people listen to. So if there's a social media platform out there that they can find out and use, we're going to use it. Uh, so LinkedIn, I can't even think of all the names. we got about 10 different things that we use now, but I don't use. Uh, the young folks use that stuff. We just help with the message. I think a part of um, resources that we use, is, I think communications is a big part of our resources that um, we use to reach people. Um, and so at Down Home, we actually have a comms department and also have a digital organizer um, that works on um, using social media to talk about things like what's a budget, you know, what what are the different roles that are happening, but also to um, give people a place to just sound off for things when they need to sound off and 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 have conversation about what's happening. Yeah, we had one of them that did uh, a thing on uh, social media on bullying in school that went viral. Uh, they produced it and, and put it out there and all that on on how the effects of bullying and how students can uh, do things to try to prevent some of that. So social media, that's my young folks thing. That's what they do. And they're great at it. That's awesome. Thanks, y'all. Um, we have a question about door knocking. So when you go door knocking, what kinds of questions do you ask to generate potential interest? And what kind of things do you hear from folks on the ground when you're out knocking doors? I think for us, it depends on what the purpose of the door knocking is. Sometimes it is a listening door knocking where you're just simply asking people what keeps you up at night and talking through what those issues are and, and saying, what do you think is keeping you from getting to that and helping people to understand and have that conversation. And then there are conversations that we are going to have to have or persuasive conversations that we're going to have at the door or we're going to try to persuade people to um, vote for candidates that we've endorsed and try to use um, conversation about um, the things that they share with us and to point to help them put the pieces together to understand how um, voting affects whatever that issue is or the things that they have. And so those are some of the conversations that we have. I think um, on the doors is just as equally important to listen as it is to talk and to ask questions. Yeah, I would say too, it's relevant. It's what what's said on the doors has got to be relevant. You know, you got a you got a message that you want to get out on certain issues, but uh, like was said, it's to, to get the conversation going, you got to present something that's relevant to the person or the group that you're talking to. Uh, because if you don't, uh, you're not going to get past much past the hello. Uh, and since since our staff people are from the area that they live in, the communities. Uh, they they know what's what's happening in that community and how to start that conversation. Uh, uh, so we get a really good contact rate uh, when we do do canvassing. And I'll just chime in to say that you know there's always there are always other ways to reach voters, but none of them consistently are ever as effective as that conversation at the door. Um, it's really, there really is no substitute for that high quality conversation at the door, somebody from the community talking about issues, things that matter to people. Um, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. And that's both, uh, offer that as a, as a qualitative assessment and also something that's been tested scientifically that we know that, that the conversations at the doors in particular, the deep relational conversations, there is nothing like it for moving people. Um, and not just moving people in the short term, but really moving people for the long term, changing people's positions on 
on some very difficult issues or some very difficult elections. It's all possible um, at the doors with that patience. Thanks, y'all. Um, so our next question is something I know we've all been thinking about, which is the voter suppression laws um, that recently came into effect in North Carolina. So what impact do you see the recent voter suppression laws having and how do you plan to overcome that? Um, down home, along with uh, some other voting right groups, just uh, entered into a lawsuit against the um, Senate Bill 747 that basically would um, disenfranchise people over something as simple as a typographical error or mistake that could possibly happen through a post office. Um, and so, you know, what this lawsuit that we're doing is not even a radical lawsuit. We're just asking the court to keep things the way it was before this law where people will not find their ballots thrown out um, without notice and the opportunity to fight for their ballots to count. Um, although we're being told this is a fraud prevention, we actually believe it's just voter suppression, just plain and simple. Yeah, for us, uh, we've been in this, this thing a long time. Uh, I was directly involved in this voter suppression when it came around years ago. Uh, we were one of the four organizations that filed lawsuits, and I was one of the people that had to testify uh, before the federal courts and all of that. But in 2018, uh, they brought up the photo ID and all this other stuff, and we knew that we couldn't change, we couldn't win the court in time for the elections. So the groups got together and put together a plan to actually get people photo ID uh, as far as the redistricting, you put together a plan to let people know when you call them and when you knock on the doors, you have the conversation about where their, where their new, new voting place is, and you have the conversation about how they're going to get there, maybe offer a ride to the polls of folks that might be physically challenged or seniors. So you just have to work hard. Uh, you can't just, you can't wait for the lawsuit because what happened to us then, they kept appealing it. Uh, to get it past the election time. So you just got to work harder. In North Carolina, you just got to know, in a Jim Crow state, you just got to know that they're always going to try to come up with something to prevent you from voting. Uh, so you have to come up with ways to, to get around that. And that's one of the things that we're looking at and talking about now. We beat them in 2018. Uh, we can beat them in 2024. We're just going to work not just hard, but hard and smart and we'll win. It's, we've done it in the past. We know how to do it. We can do it in the future. We can do it in 2024. Thanks so much, y'all. Uh, we've got two more questions. So the first one is, uh, what's the message y'all are giving to unregistered voters as to why they should register and participate? How do you get those folks engaged? Well, um, it's, it's, it's not the same conversation for everybody. There is no specific phrase that I can say, this is what you say to people to give them a registered vote. Because it's been mentioned earlier, um, you got to have the conversation with the person. You got to be, you got to be honest about it, that you're really interested in them uh, getting registered. And you got to be able to explain to them that that's where their power comes, that's going to support their community. If they're concerned about education, you got to be able to explain to them how that's going to help them uh, get a better education for themselves and for their, for their, for their children, on how it's going to help them uh, help you, how we're going to help them uh, uh, do better in their community. Some people, they want to talk about jobs. Uh, so when you register those folks, especially this year, you got to talk about how uh, politically we got the Build Back Better program and infrastructure programs, and that's because people registered and voted. And you got to just more or less say to them that uh, a lot of politicians, if you're not registered, you're not really in the system. So it depends on who you're talking to. Uh, we have some great folks that do reg voter registration, 20, 30, 40, 50 cards a day. Uh, 
But what they say to me is that you got to talk, you got to have the conversation with the person about where they're at. You got to find out where they're at and you got to show them how voter registration is going to help move them and their family forward. And then they will, they will register to vote. The hardest part is getting them to have that conversation. But once you have it, they're saying that, that most people that they talk to will register to vote, particularly young people, once they can convince them the power of the vote, because there's been billions of dollars spent to convince them that their vote doesn't matter. So you got to have a conversation to reinforce that, that their vote does matter. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, and then our last question is going to be about gerrymandering. So, you know, we just got draft maps released this week. Of course, you know, they're horribly gerrymandered. Um, what do we do about this? You know, how do we how do we fight back against um, this gerrymandering that the legislature is pushing on on our people? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, we're in a real hard spot when it comes to the maps. Um, as as many of y'all know on this call, uh, we lost control of the state Supreme Court uh, in the last election, and the new state Supreme Court um, has overruled the previous rulings that had had, had made call these uh, these maps uh, these sorts of maps uh, uh, unconstitutional. Um, so uh, you know, there's 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 really are not going to be a lot of shortcuts. Um, I think. Uh, the number one priority continues to be electing Democratic governor and breaking that supermajority. Um, but I, I would be lying to say it's going to be easy because of what they've been able to do to the maps. Um, and, you know, uh, it just move a couple of precincts here and there and you make the district just that much harder to win. Um, but the districts are winnable. Um, they're winnable with strong candidates. They're winnable with the kind of deep relational work that we've been talking about on this call. They're with a lot of shoe leather. Um, and so, you know, the, the maps just came in this past week. Uh, so uh, people are still crunching the numbers and all those sorts of things. But um, I don't think that uh, I don't think that we have that, that things are all as lost. Um, but it is an uphill battle. And it's going to take the kind of dedication uh, that we're talking about on this call. And it's going to take a lot of time, early money, um, early preparation, uh, early planning, um, but it can be done, um, and it can be done against against some pretty steep odds. And let me let me say this: it was my displeasure during the last time that they did this. I had to learn all those maps across the state, and it was crazy. Uh, but there's one thing that I learned in looking at the criteria that they used to draw the maps, and so I'm really glad I knew they were going to redistrict and redraw them but they finally got them done. So now we can look at the maps, look at the criteria. And what we're gonna find is, it's what we gotta do more work at, is they tried to carve it out based on uh, stats that show that they can win. <clears throat> but there's a, there's a lot of folks that are not in the system, they're not registered. They've been uh, taken off in North Carolina, probably half a million people that they don't count when they draw the maps. We got to work and get with those people. There's enough of those people out there to make those that redistricting in most of these counties, like Theo's talking about, where they're going to be between one and three percent. We get to those folks, get them registered, get them active, and then we can counter their maps. I wouldn't have said that a week ago because I didn't want them to hear that. But now that they've actually put them out there, let's get busy looking at the maps and take their maps that they've drawn and turn them around on them and kick their butt with them. Because North Carolina, now that they've drawn them and they've agreed to them, they just can't come back and change them because they realize that maybe it's not going to work the way they want it to. That's my that's that's what I believe anyway. That's what's happened in 18 and some more times when they redrawn the maps. I'm just glad they finally got it done so we know what we're playing with. Yeah, there is something to be said for certainty <laughs> over wondering what it's going to look like when it finally drops, for sure. Um, thanks, y'all. We got one more question. I think we have time, and then we'll um, pass it to uh, one of our hosts to close us up. So this question is about how you follow up with the folks that you reach out to. So 
um, specifically, is there a place for handwritten postcards to thank folks for registering to vote? Um, and what follow up are y'all are you doing with come after you have conversations with folks on the doors? Well, I'll just say that that one of the great advantages of being rooted community organizations talking to people on the doors is that we're not just asking them to vote, we're also asking them to be, get involved. And so one of the one of the, you know, a great conversation with a great canvasser can lead to would you like to volunteer? Would you like to come to our next chapter meeting? Um, and I think that's the real that's the real power of this model of organizing is that we're not just limiting ourselves to talking to people you know, once once every two years, right before the election, that we're actually giving people an opportunity to really get engaged and fight for those issues that we're talking about. So we talk with people about what matters to them. We ask, we agitate them. We say, what would it be different? What would, how would things be different if that were to change? How would your life be different? And would you, would you come to this next meeting and meet other people who are also interested in making those, seeing those kinds of changes in the community. And that conversation can happen at the same time that we're registering someone to vote, at the same time that we're encouraging someone to come out and turn out of the polls. Um, so I think that's the, that for, for me, that's the, the really the main advantage of this particular approach and the thing that frankly excites me the most about the number of conversations we're gonna be able to be having. Yeah, that is. Oh, I'm sorry. Are oh, you good? Go ahead. I think that that's very powerful. How oftentimes we meet people on the doors who come into the work and become canvassers themselves, become member leaders, and to be able to see this trajectory of leadership that happens with people that we meet on the doors. We have people on our staff that we met at the doors and that are now on staff. Um, and so that is um, the the biggest things. I think the other thing, a question of something that just came to me later is like also helping people at the doors understand that voting is not the end, it's actually the beginning of a process and helping people understand that where they're needed after and 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 this work. And then the truth is that like sometimes we're passing four or five times and people are like, why do you keep coming to the door? And we're like, you haven't went to go vote yet. So we're gonna come back until you go and vote. And so it just helps to be able to build those relationships with people over a period of time. And for us, um, uh, starting with voter registration, uh, our goal is to get 100% phone numbers. And there's some weeks and months where we hit 100%, but we average around 97, I think. Uh, and we also ask people for the email addresses uh, and what other, other information we can get. Because we're going to, uh, once they register, we're going to make sure that those people get at least two calls. Uh, and when they register a person, or when they go knock on the door, or they make a phone call, uh, they're, we we always doing surveys. That person's going to, that they're going to have that conversation with. They're going to talk about environmental justice, social justice, the education program, and they got a box they click that puts that in the van. Uh, they're also going to, based on that conversation, depends that person might want to be a volunteer one day, or they might want to uh, uh, be a, a, a community leader. So throughout the entire year, we go back and pull that information up, and we communicate with those folks uh, during the year. Uh, so that's, that's what we do. Uh, it's not just vote register, we threw with you, vote we threw with you. We use our election season uh, to actually decide who we're gonna talk to all during the year next year because we run a year round program and across, uh, across 100 counties. Awesome, thanks y'all so much. We appreciate you and all of your work. Thanks for being here with us tonight. Um, we're going to close out our panel, and I'm going to pass it to Jeff Bloom uh, with All In for NC, one of our gracious uh, hosts and a master fundraiser, to close us out. Thank you, Jillian. Thank you, all of you. Uh, those of you on this call tonight need to understand that you have just listened to three of the best organizers in America. 
who we are very fortunate to have leading major organizations in North Carolina. Uh, and as somebody who <clears throat> was a professional organizer for 40 years and now a volunteer one, uh, I am always just impressed at the level of depth and the level of cooperation uh, of these people. Uh, North Carolina has 100 counties. The rest of the US has 49 states. All In For North Carolina seeks to get activists and donors from all those other states to help North Carolina organizations and candidates build power and win elections. Uh, RVNC has been an exemplary partner of ours. Uh, and as I say, these are just fabulous groups and we have previously in the last cycle run fundraising events for each of them. Jillian, uh, who uh, to the detriment of the people of Durham is leaving the city council, uh, is an inspired, thoughtful and inclusive leader uh, whose vision of building power throughout the Southeast is very important. Uh, All In For North Carolina is proud to support this event. Uh, I myself gave again during the call, please, please, please give generously. And after you do, uh, we would like to ask you to do a couple of other things. In the next two weeks before the election, we are phone banking. We've been doing it since 1st of July with the Mecklenburg County Democratic Party under new leadership. Uh, and right now we are recruiting canvassers to go door to door to take back a town that the Democrats have never competed for in the history of the state called Huntersville, second largest town in Mecklenburg County. And it is our pilot project uh, about rebuilding democratic political power in Mecklenburg. And our callers, and I think Trudy Obi may still be on this call tonight, is one of them can attest that we are getting people signing up to Canvas uh, with a phone call from somebody from Massachusetts or Vermont or California. Uh, then in the next month, uh, we will have an event uh, co-sponsored by seven other organizations, and we welcome more. Uh, on December 5th with Senator Raphael Warnock, uh, in which we will raise money for the new Democratic Party leadership uh, statewide and local in Mecklenburg. But our goal, as I think David said earlier, or, or Steve, is that Mecklenburg is the most underorganized big county in the state, and we are putting everything we've got in to try to reduce that margin of 50,000 undervotes in Mecklenburg County. Uh, I think somebody may be putting in the chat links for these two activities and for a uh, our newsletter. Uh, please get in touch. All In For North Carolina tries to make the kind of work that is happening tonight efficient all over the country on behalf of these great organizations who are providing the leadership that we're happy to support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, and that closes us out for the evening. I wanna thank everyone so much for being with us tonight. Thank you to Attorney General Stein. Thank you to our incredible panelists and to all of the folks who are on the ground uh, here in North Carolina doing this important work. And thank you all, especially to you, our supporters. Of course, we couldn't do it without you. Um, and a, a very special thanks to our hosts, the folk David and Steve from Register and Vote NC and Jeff from All In for NC. Um, these donor circles raise, as they said, hundreds of thousands of dollars to support North Carolina organizations doing this incredibly important, incredibly intensive, um, you know, door by door and uh, just really, you know, labor intensive, important work of getting out, um, getting out and talking to folks in our community um, getting out the vote and and really changing our state for the better. So really appreciate all of you for your interest in North Carolina, for your support of our work. Um, thank you so much. You'll all be receiving a follow-up email, um, which will include another, which will include a link to our donation page. We are just $412 short of reaching $20,000 for this event. So if you could kick us um, another 10 bucks or forward that email 
to a friend or a family member to help us get to that $20,000 mark. Um, we will be so appreciative. Um, if you're interested in volunteering, please um, check out the links in the chat for opportunities to volunteer. Uh, and we hope you all have a, a great night. Thank you all again so much for joining us. Um, thank you for your support. Good night.